<sighs> Why, hello there. I'm the Sleepy Kangaroo, and thank you for joining me tonight as we read one of my favorite stories by the famous poet and storyteller Edgar Allan Poe. But before we start, let's find a comfortable position in our jolly swags and take a few long, deep breaths. In. And out. In. And out. And now, feel your body start to relax and become heavy as I read you this story titled Landor's Cottage. During a pedestrian trip last summer, through one or two of the river countries of New York, I found myself, as the day declined, somewhat embarrassed about the road I was pursuing. The land undulated very unremarkably, and my path for the last hour had wound about and about so confusedly in its effort to keep in the valleys that I no longer knew in what direction lay the sweet village of B, where I had determined to stop for the night. The sun had scarcely shone, strictly speaking, during the day, which, nevertheless, had been unpleasantly warm. A smoky mist resembling that of the Indian summer enveloped all things, and of course added to my uncertainty. Not that I cared much about the matter. If I did not hit upon the village before sunset, or even before dark, it was more than possible that a little Dutch farmhouse, or something of that kind, would soon make its appearance. Although in fact the neighbourhood, perhaps on account of being more picturesque than fertile, was very sparsely inhabited. At all events, with my knapsack for a pillow and my hand as a century, a bivouac in the open air was just the thing which would have amused me. I sauntered on, therefore, quite at ease, Punto taking charge of my gun, until at length, just as I had begun to consider whether the numerous little glades that led hither and thither were intended to be paths at all, I was conducted by one of them into an unquestionable carriage track. There could be no mistaking it. The traces of light wheels were evident, and although the tall shrubberies and overgrown undergrowth met overhead, there was no obstruction whatever below, even to the passage of a Virginian mountain wagon, the most aspiring vehicle I take it of its kind. The road, however, except in being open through the wood, if wood be not too weighty a name for such an assemblage of trees, and except in the particulars of evident wheel tracks, bore no resemblance to any road I had seen before. The tracks of which I speak were but faintly perceptible, having been impressed upon the firm yet pleasantly moist surface of what looked more like green genoa velvet than anything else. It was grass, clearly, but grass such as we seldom see out of England, so short, so thick, so even, and so vivid in colour. Not a single impediment lay in the wheel route. Not even a chip or dead twig. The stones that once obstructed the way had been carefully placed, not thrown, along the sides of the lane, so as to define its boundaries at bottom with a kind of half-precise, half-negligent and wholly picturesque definition. 
Clumps of wild flowers grew everywhere, luxuriantly, in the interspaces. What to make of all this, of course I knew not. Here was art, undoubtedly. That did not surprise me. All roads, in the ordinary sense, are works of art. Nor can I say that there was much to wonder at in the mere excess of art manifested. All that seemed to have been done might have been done here, with such natural capabilities as they have it in the books on landscape gardening, with very little labour and expense. No, it was not the amount, but the character of the art which caused me to take a seat on one of the blossomy stones and gaze up and down this fairy-like avenue for half an hour or more, in bewildered admiration. One thing became more and more evident the longer I gazed, an artist, and one with the most scrupulous eye for form, had superintended all these arrangements. The greatest care had been taken to preserve a due medium between the neat and graceful on the one hand, and the picturesque in the true sense of the Italian term on the other. There were few straight and no long uninterrupted lines. The same effect of curvature or of colour appeared twice, usually, but not oftener than any one point of view. Everywhere was a variety and uniformity. It was a piece of composition in which the most fastidiously critical taste could scarcely have suggested an emendation. I turned to the right as I entered this road, and now, arising, I continued in the same direction. The path was so serpentine that at no moment could I trace its course or more than two or three paces in advance. Its character did not undergo any material change. Presently, the murmur of water fell gently upon my ear, and in a few moments afterward, I was turned with the road somewhere more abruptly than hitherto. I became aware that a building of some kind lay at the foot of a gentle declivity just before me. I could see nothing distinctly on account of the mist which occupied the little valley below. A gentle breeze, however, now arose as the sun was about descending, and while I remained standing on the brow of the slope, the fog gradually became dissipated into wreaths and so floated over the scene. As it came fully into view, thus gradually, as I describe it, piece by piece, here a tree, there a glimpse of water, and here again the summit of a chimney, I could scarcely help fancying that the whole was one of the ingenious illusions sometimes exhibited under the name of varnishing pictures. By the time, however, that the fog had thoroughly disappeared, the sun had made its way down behind the gentle hills, and then, as if with a slight chaussée to the south, had come again fully into sight, glaring with a purplish luster through a chasm that entered the valley from the west. Suddenly, therefore, as if by the hand of magic, this whole valley and everything in it became brilliantly visible. The first coup d'oeil, as the sun slid into the position described, impressed me very much, as I have been impressed, when a boy, by the concluding scene of some well-arranged theatrical spectacle or melodrama. Not even the monstrosity of colour was wanting, for the sunlight came out through the chasm, tinted all orange and purple, while the vivid green of the grass in the valley was reflected more or less upon all objects. From the curtain of vapour that still hung overhead, as if loath to take its total departure from a scene so enchantingly beautiful, 
The little veil into which I thus peered down from under the fog canopy could not have been more than 400 yards long, while in breadth it varied from 50 to 150 or perhaps even 200. It was most narrow at its northern extremity, opening out as it tended southwardly, but with no very precise regularity. The widest portion was within 80 yards of the southern extreme. The slope which encompassed the vale could not fairly be called hills, unless at their northern face. Here a precipitous ledge of granite arose to a height of some 90 feet, and as I have mentioned, the valley at this point was not more than 50 feet wide. But as the visitor proceeded southwardly from this cliff, he found on his right hand and on his left declivities, at once high, less precipitous, and less rocky. All in a word, sloped and softened to the south, and yet the whole vale was engirdled by eminences, more or less high except at two points. One of these I have already spoken of. It lay considerably to the north of west, and where the sun made its way, as I have before described, into the amphitheatre through a cleanly cut natural cleft in the granite embankment. This fissure might have been ten yards wide at its widest point, so far as the eye could trace it, it seems to lead up, up like a natural causeway into the recesses of unexplored mountains and forests. The other opening was directly at the southern end of the vale. Here, generally, the slopes were nothing more than gentle inclinations extending from east to west about 150 yards. In the middle of this extent was a depression, level with the ordinary floor of the valley. As regards vegetation, as well as in respect to everything else, the scene softened and sloped to the south. To the north, on the craggy precipice, a few paces from the verge, up sprang the magnificent trunks of numerous hickories, black walnuts, and chestnuts, interspersed with occasional oak, and the strong lateral branches thrown out by the walnuts especially spread far over the edge of the cliff. Proceeding southwardly, the explorer saw, at first, the same class of trees, but less and less softly, the Salvatorish in character. Then he saw the gentler elm succeeded by sassafras and locusts. These again by the softer linden, redbud, catalpa, and maple these yet again by still more graceful and more modest varieties. The whole face of the southern declivity was covered with wild shrubbery alone, an occasional silver shadow or white poplar excepted. In the bottom of the valley itself, for it must be borne in mind that the vegetation hitherto mentioned grew only on the cliffs or hillsides, were to be seen three insulated trees. One was an elm of fine size and exquisite form. It stood guard over the southern gate of the vale. Another was a hickory, much larger than the elm, and although a much finer tree, although both were exceedingly beautiful, it seemed to have taken charge of the northwestern entrance springing from a group of rocks in the very jaws of the ravine and throwing its graceful body at an angle of nearly 45 degrees far out into the sunshine of the amphitheatre. 
About thirty yards east of this tree stood, however, the pride of the valley, and beyond all question the most magnificent tree I have ever seen, unless perhaps among the cypresses of the Ichia Tuckany, it was a triple-stemmed tulip tree, a Liriodendron tulipiferum, one of the natural order of magnolias. Its three trunks separated from the parent at about three feet from the soil and diverging very slightly and gradually were not more than four feet apart at the point where the largest stem shot about into foliage. This was at an elevation of about 80 feet. The whole height of the principal division was 120 feet. Nothing can surpass in beauty the form or the glossy, vivid green of the leaves of the tulip tree. In the present instance, they were fully eight inches wide, but their glory was altogether eclipsed by the gorgeous splendor of the profuse blossoms. Conceive, closely congregated, a million of the largest and most resplendent tulips. Only thus can the reader get any idea of the picture I would convey. And then the stately grace of the clean, delicately granulated columnar stems, the largest four feet in diameter at twenty from the ground. The innumerable blossoms mingling with those of other trees scarcely less beautiful, although infinitely less majestic, filled the valley with more than Arabian perfumes. The general floor of the amphitheater was grass of the same character as that I had found in the road, if anything more deliriously soft, thick, velvety, and miraculously green. It was hard to conceive how all this beauty had been attained. I have spoken of two openings into the vale. From the one to the northwest issued a rivulet which came, gently murmuring and slightly foaming, down the ravine until it dashed against the group of rocks out of which sprang the insulated hickory. Here, after encircling the tree, it passed on a little to the north of east, leaving the tulip tree some twenty feet to the south, and making no decided alteration in its course until it came near the midway between the eastern and western boundaries of the valley. At this point, after a series of sweeps, it turned off at right angles and pursued a generally southern direction, meandering as it went, until it became lost in a small lake of a regular figure. Although roughly oval, that lay gleaming near the lower extremity of the vale. This lakelet was, perhaps, a hundred yards in diameter at its widest part. No crystal could be clearer than its waters. Its bottom, which could be distinctly seen, consisted altogether of pebbles brilliantly white. Its banks of the southern emerald grass already described rounded rather than sloped off into the clear haven below. And so clear was this haven, so perfectly at times did it reflect all objects above it, that where the true bank ended and where the mimic one commenced, it was a point of no little difficulty to determine. The trout and some other varieties of fish, with which this pond seemed to be almost inconveniently crowded, had all the appearance of veritable flying fish. It was almost impossible to believe that they were not absolutely suspended in the air. 
A light birch canoe that lay placidly on the water was reflected in its minutest fibres with a fidelity unsurpassed by the most exquisitely polished mirror. A small island, fairly laughing with flowers in full bloom and affording little more space than just enough for a picturesque little building, seemingly a fowl house arose from the lake not far from its northern shore, to which it was connected by means of an inconceivably light-looking and yet very primitive bridge. It was formed of a single, broad and thick plank of the tulip wood. It was forty feet long and spanned the interval between shore and shore with a slight but very perceptible arch preventing all oscillation. From the southern extreme of the lake issued a continuation of the rivulet, which, after meandering for perhaps thirty yards, finally passed through the depression already described in the middle of the southern declivity and tumbling down a sheer precipice to a hundred feet made its devious and unnoticed way to the Hudson. The lake was deep, at some points thirty feet, but the rivulet seldom exceeded three, while its greatest width was about eight. Its bottom and banks were as those of the pond. If a defect could have been attributed in point of picturesqueness, it was that of excessive neatness. Ah, uh, well, thank you for listening to tonight's sleep story. If you have any recommendations on what I should read next, please feel free to leave a comment below or send me an email at sleepykangaroostories at gmail.com. Thank you once again, and sweet dreams.